I guess. Father, in this place, this very day, I pray that the joy of the Lord would fill the sanctuary. 
Father, that in this place we recognize that you are our God. You are our King. Father, you are the one who set the captives free. And Father, we rejoice this very morning that we are free. And we are free indeed found in the blood of Christ. Father, you do not hold our sins against us. Father, in this place today, may you wash us clean. May we find the joy of the Lord deep within our souls. Father, may we leave the burdens outside. Father, I pray that they would not hinder us again. In this place, this day, may we walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. May we walk in the love and the peace and the joy and the grace and the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus Christ. Have your way among us in this place this day. Bless us as we seek to honor you. Bless you in the name of your son we pray. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. Who we got in the doghouse this morning? Felipe Moreno. You the man. You the man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. All right. Okay. It's good. It's good. I don't know about this jersey thing going on here. It's uh, more of a Steeler fan, you know. It's, it's, okay. it's okay. We'll, we'll pray for you. <laughs> You're going to pray for me. Ah, I like it. I like it. How can we pray for you, my friend? Um, some more peace in life, I guess. Peace in life? Yeah, safety, all that. Okay. Some protection, physical protection. Physical also. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, just pray for my beautiful girlfriend over there. Okay, too, you know, sure. She can continue to grow in the spirit. And Amen. Keep all right. My little brother, so I'd love to see him get back in the church yeah, more because okay. he used to come all the time. And all right. sort of going off the path. But, okay, you know, all right. I want to trust it's all in God's plan, so Amen. we can pray for him too. Amen. Him Amen. Yeah, we could do that for sure. All right, absolutely. Um, for yourself, your protection, your well-being, your spiritual strength, your girlfriend, your brothers, and those that are around you as well, we'll pray for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you for my dear friend and my brother in Christ, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for the way in which he continues to inspire me. So I thank you personally for who he is, what he does, and how he serves you, Father, and how it serves as an example in his life inspires me, Father. So I just uphold him before you. Pray you would continue to bless him, honor him, Father. Continue to uphold him physically and keep him safe and protected, Father. Continue to keep him emotionally stable, Father, as he seeks to and desires to serve you and to honor you. Father, watch over him financially. Continue to be his provision. Father, watch over him spiritually as well. May his uh, depths of spirituality grow and his understanding of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and all that you have for him, Father, may it flood into the very depths of his soul and his understanding, knowledge, and wisdom of who you are, how you love him, and how you love others. And Father, I would pray for his girlfriend, I pray for his brother, I pray for all those that are around him, Father, and pray that his life continues to serve as a witness and example. And Father, we know that by your Holy Spirit, you continue to minister into the lives of those that are around him. And Father, we look for the ways in which you are going to continue to bring about the knowledge and the saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. amen. You know I love you, bro. Come on, give me a squeeze. God bless you, God bless you. All right, my friend, God bless you, God bless you. Is there, st there's stuff, there must be stuff, okay? There's always stuff, you know, there's always stuff. And particularly, particularly now, because it's December, there's a lot of stuff going on. So let's hear about some stuff. Okay, I'm going to start with stuff. I'm sure that when you walked in this morning out there, you saw in the foyer, you saw a big box, you saw gifts, and then I, you might have taken time to read it. And what this is, we've been asked if we could have a donation box put in, in memory of a gunnery sergeant, Marine Corps gunnery sergeant, Ray Lanise, died rather young in his 40s, and this is why it's in his memory. Uh, but he's uh, lived out in Wellington for many years, and I'm sure this is through the VFW organization. And if you go out and read some of the little details, it, this is just almost like the uh, Marine Corps Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots Marine Corps Reserve is a great thing to give to. And, but those toys go out to every individual that they can find in need. The difference on this one, which is this, these toys, or whatever you may be willing to put into that box, brand new now, unwrapped, be for a boy or girl, whether you put one present in there, two, or as many as you want. The difference is 
These gifts will be for where the families have a deployed parent, whether it's the mother or whether it's the father. In some odd cases, you know, sometimes it's both parents can be deployed. But these gifts will be going to the families of deployed parents. I kind of appreciate that. Just puts a little bit of different twist. But both of these organizations, I'm all for it. And as I said, I never met Ray Lanise, but I know he's a former Marine. I can say simplify to him, as if I did know him. But anyway, so if you feel free, the box will be, well, you've got two more Sundays. And this, well, you've got two more Sundays to bring these gifts in. I think someone's going to pick it up on the 21st. So if you feel free to do so and you would love to do so, bring in a brand new unwrapped gift for boy or girl, one, two, or as many as you want to put in the box. We would greatly appreciate it. And I think those who are sponsoring this for uh, Ray, uh, they would greatly appreciate it too. Thank you. Oh, um, wait we, a have a, we have a couple oh. of things. There are a few other things that are in the bulletin. Uh, the blood drive will be here next week if you didn't see the notices that were taped to the doors and whatnot. And uh, there's other information that's in the bulletin. Our Christmas on the lawn is coming up next week. There's a congregational meeting right after church. So be sure and get a bulletin so that way you're, you're well informed. Okay, now you can say it. Okay. Oh, and decorating the, the Christmas tree right after service today. Everyone put their own special touch on it. You know, I, I would be a bit honored to take this stuff out. I can't do that. Don't say, check this out. <laughs>
and it's crazy how so mighty you are to save and how amazing you do in all of our lives, whether it's in the smallest or the biggest ways, you do what you do and you're absolutely amazing. I want to pray for Pastor Stan that he gets this message across and that somebody or anybody or everybody gets something from it and, and learns and grows from it and you're just awesome. In your heavenly name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that awesome time of worship. That was wonderful. Um, before we get into the scripture reading, this is Luke 3, right? Is that where it was? Luke 3? All right. <clears throat> so, and we're talking about John the Baptist and, it's, you know, the forerunner uh, to Jesus. But before there was a forerunner, there was a forerunner to the forerunner. And before there was a forerunner, there was a forerunner to the forerunner. And so I just kind of wanted to introduce you a little bit to John the Baptist. And uh, we'll read a little bit. Luke 3, you read about him a little bit. But this was prior to, and just in case you were unaware, uh, I wanted to make you aware. In the time of Herod, I'm reading from Luke 1. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, and this would be John the Baptist's father, who belonged to the priesthood. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. That name rings a bell at all. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Does that sound kind of familiar in some ways too? A miracle is about to take place if you know the story. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, his duty for the priesthood, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So here's Zechariah working within the temple, and it's his turn to now go in and burn incense in the temple. And when the time came for him to burn the incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Standing at the right side of the altar of the incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear, which is very often the case when you see something very supernatural. We don't always go, rejoice, hallelujah, praise be to God, I'm looking at something totally supernatural and weird, and it usually brings some kind of fear. But the angel said to him, and you know the words, do not be afraid. How many times do we hear that in the passages of Scripture when you're encountering something supernatural, when someone's encountering something that is very beyond their own dimension, you hear them say, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. 
things, it will be John the Baptist. I could leave it right there. But describing John the Baptist, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. This is the Nazarene creed, right? Like Samson, right? I bet he probably never cut his hair. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many, in the speaking of John the Baptist, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and to the disobedient to the wisdom and to the righteousness to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This was John the Baptist's ministry. And here, Glenn, my brother Glenn's going to come on up and You're going to hear a little bit about this John the Baptist and what he was saying. Sir, thank you, my friend. Good morning, church. All right, so I got a little assistance here, but all right. This is uh, taken from Luke 3, 1 through 20. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Traconius and Lysanias, uh, tetrarch of Albany. During the high priesthood of Ananias and, Sapphi- and Sapphias, the work of God came. I'm sorry, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went in, into the country around the Jordan, preaching um, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone, has two, anyone who has two shirts should, sit, should share one with one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chafe with unquenched fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. God bless the reading of his will. sir. Before there was a Christmas season, there was a preparation. A preparation. Do we see that happening? You could see that in John the Baptist's father preparing the way, and then John the Baptist preparing the way. There was a preparation for the most extraordinary thing that was ever to happen in all of earth, 
and ready in heaven. On earth and in heaven. Heaven is celebrating something right along with us that is magnificent and extraordinary. It's their arrival of the Yeshua. It's spirit becoming flesh. The Messiah. Jesus, the Christ. And really there was kind of no better person to kind of prepare the way than John the Baptist. He was an advocate. He was an advocate for God and an advocate for preparing the way and turning people to repentance and back to God. And he resembled a lot of the old time or the Old Testament prophets. When you think about Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist would fit right in well. He'd be one of those kind. Along the same lines, even our scriptures would tell us, like Elijah. He resembled those old-time prophets. And after all, like Jesus, he had been sent. And much like the Old Testament prophets, they were the prom promoting and prophesying the word of God. He went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I looked at that, and King James Version reads a little bit different, and probably a little bit closer. King James Version reads a remission of sins. A remission of sins. Is there a difference between remission and elimination? Remission, like the Old Testament priesthood that would go into the temple every year and then go back every year for the remission of sins every year. They'd go back in for forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins over and over and over again. But John's speaking something different. He, he, he's talking about preparing the way for the one who takes away the sins of the world. Prepare ye the way for the one who eliminates all sins for all time. Can you see the difference? The difference between remission and elimination? Is there a difference? Just ask any cancer patient. Here's your first one. John had a purpose. He had a purpose. And the first thing that John encourages us to do in, in preparing the way for Christ is to show remorse for our sins, to believe what God says about us, that there is sin that is separating us from God, to repent of our sins. This was the main message in preparing us for our acceptance of Christ, and it is still applicable today. John called everyone to repentance. Everyone. He called out the teachers of the law. He called out the Pharisees. He called out the scholars. He called out the poor. He called out the Roman soldiers. He called everyone to repentance and to get right before God, calling them to a right way of living, to living God's way, not your way, not the ways of the world, to live God's way. Do you recognize that your testimony will outlive your title? You recognize this, right? In your own life, your testimony will outlive any kind of title that you might bestow upon yourself. Your testimony will outlive your professional accolades or your athletic trophies or your bank account. Your testimony must begin with repentance, a turning to God, a recognition we failed before God. We failed, and we need a Savior. And listen, we are so fortunate to be on this side of the cross because we get to have elimination of our sins. Communion table in remembrance of what I have done. Do you remember? I have eliminated the sins. And if you're not right with God, 
Today is the day you can get right with God. And this is the place to get right with God. Sanctified and holy ground is the place. It's the right place, and it's now. And you recognize that if you're not right before God, your testimony will be invalid. Many teachers of the law, the Pharisees, they came out to see John because John was a happening thing, baby. You know, that was the mega church at the time, man. That's the top rank. That's where everybody's talking about. That's what everybody wants to go see. They got to go see the show, man. You know, it's going to be the top notch. John knew the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those. They were coming to be baptized not because they were sorry for their sins. He knew instead they were coming to be baptized because it was the thing to do. You want to appear righteous and religious before everybody, so you will go with the righteous and the religious, and you feel that you're a part of what's going on, particularly in keeping up appearances. It was a full-time job for those leaders trying to keep up appearances before their congregants, their constituents. These leaders didn't seriously think they needed baptism. After all, John calls them out on it. You're Abraham's children. And do not think that you have special treatment because you are Abraham's children. But really, didn't that mean that they had a free ticket to heaven? Did it? Weren't they God's chosen people? Weren't they guaranteed the free ride? We could come to worship a lot with the same attitude. I hear it a lot with denomination, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I say, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Methodist. A Methodist? You're counting on being a Methodist to get you into heaven? you count Catholic? You're counting on Catholic to get you being in heaven? You're counting on being a Baptist? Only, only a good, good King James Version of the Baptist read only. That's who I am. That gets me into heaven. Does it? We could come to church not because we want to hear God's word, but out of a sense of some obligation or family tradition. <laughs> Just wait for Christmas, right? Just wait for Christmas. Everybody's showing up. Why? Tradition, right? Because their grandma begged them to go. Just to keep up appearances, show off the newest hat, check out my new shoes. In the process, listen, we can even begin to trick ourselves into believing that heaven is ours by virtue of our church attendance or by virtue of our good deeds. Mm, how many times you hear, I'm a good person? I'm one of the chosen people of God. Why? Because I'm a good person. I give a lot away to charity. After all, I brought a teddy bear in for the toy drive. I'm a good. So far too many people are not searching for God. They're not searching for how God might transform them and change them and challenge them and move them. They're not seeking a spiritual dimension in their lives. They only want to keep up appearances. Or if they're searching for something, they're searching for some good music. There needs to be good music. It has to be entertaining. It has to be a good light show at church. If there's not a good light show at church, then it's not really church. Really. Or comfortable chairs. Would you come to this church if we didn't have, you know, four-inch padded seats and it was a hard bench for you to sit on? Yeah, you wouldn't. You'd go somewhere else. But you'd be more comfortable there, right? Because after all, it's about your physical comfort that church is about. Or they're looking for the right handsome pastor. <laughs> Where's all the right clothes? Well, at least you got one right. Hey! And, and, and he's humble too. Or programs and activities that keep them thinking that they are the children of God, you know? When here, watch, listen. They're religious consumers. And these are the very same people that will tell you they're not religious. Do you see it? Can you see the ways of man that sometimes they, they don't even, they don't get it themselves in themselves? God's shining light. God is doing something. But do you see it in you? In your own repentance, in your own transformation, in your own walk, in your own humility, in your own humbleness? See, worship is not something you consume. Worship is something you create. See, I don't need padded chairs to worship God. I don't need air conditioning to worship God. 
I don't need the right clothes to worship God. But the idea is that I want to worship God. John had some pretty strong words for those that were kind of like that. You brood of vipers, deceitful, putting up appearances, just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Eden. If you're outwardly living a life of a believer without believing, living the outward life of a believer without transformation, living the life of a believer without repentance, without a testimony of what God has done for you in your life. You brood of vipers. But what does it exactly mean to repent? To, to show remorse over your sin. To show remorse is to, just to change your mind about sin. To repent is to turn away from the sin and move the other way. And sin, such a biblical word. Such a sacred word. Say it in society. Say it in the world. Say it at the workplace. Say it in your household. That there is sin. And watch what comes against you. To hold a heavy, sorrow-filled, shame, guilt, shame, even guilt for our own actions. See, it means that we no longer view sin as something that is fun and exciting. I remember those days when I did. Sin was so fun and exciting. But we begin to view sin a little bit differently as we mature in our understanding of what Christ has done for us. We don't begin to view sin as something which can't be helped. Oh, yes, it can. And it can be eliminated and washed clean along with your guilt and your shame. We begin to understand that sin is harmful. It's harmful to yourself and to those around you. It means that we see sin for what it is, something that damages our relationship with God. If you want to have a relationship with God, how much do you want to continue to damage that relationship? If you believe in God, how long do you want to continue to damage that relationship with God? Day after day after day after day after day, living your ways and not God's ways, and continuing to ask him for forgiveness for the things that you continue to do? That's confession, not repentance. Sin damages your relationship with God, and it damages your relationship with others and those that are around you. Sin damages, sin crushes, sin destroys, sin separates us from God and continues to separate us from God. Sin lies, sin cheats, sin deceives, sin places you in bondage and slavery. Sin steals your joy. Sin binds you with shame, shackles you with guilt and trauma. Day after day after day, sin hurts. Give me that slide, Jody. Sin hurts. What? You got something to say about oh, that? Oh, I always got something to say, man. Oh, why don't you say something? I'm going to say something. And I'm going to do it, I guess, the only way I know how. I hope. <laughs> Praise God. Sin hurts, sin scars, sin wounds, and mars any faith not tough or strong enough to take a lot of pain and take a lot of strain. Sin is like a cloud, holds a lot of rain. Sin hurts. Ooh, sin hurts. I'm old. I 
It's hot. Sin hurts. Ooh, ooh, sin hurts. Some fool sin for happiness, blissfulness, togetherness. Some fools fool. Fool themselves, I guess, but sin's not fooling me. I know it isn't true. I know it isn't true. Sin is just a lie made to make you blue. Sin hurts. Ooh, sin hurts. to make you blue sin hurts ooh, ooh sin hurts ooh sin hurts ooh, ooh. I pray you get that amen That's a testimony, brother. That's a testimony, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness. Sin in your life will destroy you. Give me that next slide. Sin corrupts your character. Erodes your soul. Bitterness, revenge, hatred, greed, lust. Sins run rampant. Sin hurts. And well, folks, we all stand guilty. We all stand guilty. There is not one righteous in this room. Not one. And it has been God's grace that has sustained us. Can I get an amen? amen. Anybody else that really should be dead? I should have been taken out a long time ago. How then do we view sin, something that separates us from God, with sadness, with remorse, with guilt, and with shame? But how do we view God's grace? Rejoicing for His great grace. Rejoicing for His plan, not any longer for the remission of sins, but for the elimination of sin. In your life how do we view God for what he has done about our sin lots of rejoicing 
Lots of praise, lots of dancing, lots of praying, lots of gratitude, lots of thankfulness. See, I want to see if you can catch the subtlety. Fear-based repentance, fear-based repentance makes us hate ourselves. Grace-based repentance makes us hate sin. God loves you, right? We hear this all the time. God loves you. But then there's this sin, and the elimination, the sin. How then do we respond in repentance? Fear? Well, some. Grace? Fear-based repentance makes us hate ourselves. But grace-based repentance makes us hate sin. Not people. Sin. John knew his purpose, and he was, he was very well prepared for it. Foretold centuries, right, before. He never questioned God's purpose for his life. He just went about doing it, preparing the way for the Lord. Repent, he would say, for the kingdom of God is near. I'll echo his message. Congregation, church, repent. The kingdom of God is near. Today is the day of your repentance. Today is the day to wash yourselves clean. And John never wavered from fulfilling his purpose. He never got tired of serving God. He didn't retire from serving God. He didn't take a break. He didn't burn out from serving. John was not the type to back away from fulfilling God's purpose in his life. So this beckons your next slide. What godly purpose are you serving? See, we look back and we can read the scriptures and go, well, I can see what John the Baptist's purpose was. I can see what Jesus' purpose was. Amazing, awesome, and he did it for me. What's my, why? What's my, is there some significance to you? I would say this. Your godly purpose is probably in alignment with your spiritual gifts. Probably in alignment with your passions. John was a voice calling to the ones in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways made smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John had a voice. It's your next one. John had a voice. He put a voice to his purpose. He could explain it. He might have even been able to sing it. Who knows? His purpose. Point people to Jesus Christ. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. The message proclaimed the Messiah, the coming of the Christ. Get right before God. Make peace with your maker. Maybe your voice isn't one to call, repent. Maybe your voice isn't one to stand before, you know, a hundred people and say, Turn to the Lord. Maybe your voice is one that just says, you know, trust in Jesus for your marriage. Maybe you're just one voice that has a testimony that can just say, trust in Jesus to overcome your addiction. Can you give a voice to your purpose? Can you give a voice to your experiences? Can you give a voice to what God is doing in your life right now? Give a voice. Trust Jesus with your finances. Trust Jesus in your pain. Trust Jesus in your depression. Because the kingdom of God is near. In his message, John's met, message met people right where they were. He said to the crowds that were coming out to be baptized by them, he could see right through them. You're not here to repent. You're here to hang out with a crowd. You're here to be seen. You're here, you brood of vipers. His message would call for people to make real change. Produce good fruits in keeping with repentance. Produce good fruits in keeping with repentance. And he would challenge them, do not say, even to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. So we're all good. Oh, I'm a Catholic, so I'm good. I'm a Methodist, so I'm good. I'm a 
King James Version only Baptist, so I'm good. Is that what you're relying on? For I tell you, out of these stones, God himself could raise up children of Abraham. Don't think so highly of yourselves. He was speaking that message. You brood of vipers, hold on to your appearances when there's nothing in your heart. Well, didn't we not say, Lord, Lord? Did we not cast out demons in you? I never knew you. Some reacted. Some repented. Some ran away. What are you going to do? Produce fruits. That's what John told those who were coming out to be baptized. When the tax collectors, they were Jewish people working for the oppressive Roman government, what are we supposed to do? We're hated by everybody. No longer take more money than you have been allotted to take. Roman soldiers were moved. These are not the Jewish people. These are the Roman soldiers listening to John the Baptist talk about God and repentance and living a right life. The Roman soldiers, well, what are we supposed to do? Do not use your position to terrorize people or to extort money from them. He looks right at them and knows what they do and why they do it. What are you repenting of? He encouraged them instead to be content with their pay. What kind of advice would John be giving you regarding the fruit of your repentance? Yeah, I've been saved 35 years ago. I was watching the blood of the Lamb fell down at the altar. Hallelujah, I've never been the same. But yet, treat your neighbor like, oh my gosh. Sustain, disdain, hurt. I don't think John was a touchy-feely kind of guy, do you? I don't, I don't think, if you put him in alignment with like those Old Testament prophets, I, I, don't, I don't think they were like, you know, seeker-sensitive. You know, they, that's, I don't think that. I don't, I don't, maybe you don't either. He wasn't soft on sin, right? He wouldn't water down the gray areas so that you might feel okay about the way in which you behave. I don't think he did that. He wasn't worried about whether he offended you or not. You know what he was worried about? You offending God. I think he resembled those Old, top, top, uh, Old Testament prophets and spoke boldly and unapologetically. Sin hurts. Sin corrupts. Sin destroys. It has no place in heaven, and it has no place in the life of a believer, a Holy Spirit-filled person of God. Call it, what, call it out. You recognize your own sin? Call it out. Wash it in the blood of Jesus. Kick it out. Get rid of it. It doesn't belong in your life. Do you hear me clearly, church? Gossip and lust and the things that you bring into the sanctuary, the things that you bring in from out there into the sanctified holy ground, lay it down, confess it, repent of it, and leave it here at the cross of Jesus. He eliminated it from your life. Will you? He was calling people to real change and to hold them to their conversion. Have you been baptized? Give me, let me see your hand. Have you been baptized, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized as a believer, filled with the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Amen. You've been converted, born again, regenerated. Praise be to God. I'm a new creation and a new creature in Christ. I'm part of the church and part of the kingdom of God. God would be holding you accountable to your convictions and your belief. Don't just say, I'm sorry, God. Show you're sorry by the way you rearrange your life. I had to make some changes in my own life to the things I needed to do. I needed to stop. Stop! The places that I went to, stop! The people that I hung around with, stop! I had to unlearn a lot of things that I had learned. I had to relearn new habits and new places to go. 
The things I was thinking, I had to stop. I had to repent of my own mind that I might be transformed in my mind. Do you understand? I had to stop talking evil to myself. How many are, believe that you are your own worst enemy? What does God tell you to do with your enemies? Love your enemy. I know I'm my own worst enemy. How do I love my... I got to repent of this. I got to work on this. I got to see what you're telling me, Lord. I had to stop talking evil to myself. Listen, not slow down. Stop. So I'm sitting out here and I'm watching. I see this beautiful red Lamborghini come up off of Forest Hill, turn on to Florida Mango, and the cop pulls him over. Boom! Woo! Pulls over. Beautiful Lamborghini sitting out there. Why? <laughs> the cop goes, listen, sir, you didn't stop at the red light. But stop and make a right turn. And so the guy in the Lamborghini, stop, slow down. It's a difference. No, sir, you didn't. He needed, to, right? The light was red. You can take a right turn already. You need to stop and then proceed to make a right turn. Oh, stop, slow down. What's the difference? So the cop pulls out his billy club, hits the roof of the car. Whoopee! Whoopee! Then hits the fender. Whoopee! Whoopee! You want me to stop or slow down? Whoopee! You tell me the difference. You want me to stop or you want me to slow down? I had to stop. I had to stop, folks. You need to stop. Stop beating yourself up. God doesn't beat you up nearly <laughs> the way you beat yourself up. You say things about yourself God would never dare say about you. The man who says, I know Jesus, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. And whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. It doesn't say slow down in their sinning. It says, what's the word? No one who continues in their sin will either see him or know him. The sin that you continue to perpetuate in your life will separate you continually from God. Even though he's paid a price to eliminate it and wash it away, you choose to sin. You choose to put Christ back on the cross all the time, all the time, every time, over and over and over and over again. You're doing that. You're putting him on the cross. Your sin is putting him on the cross over and over and over again. Hebrews would say it just as blunt. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for your sin that is left. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. John the Baptist said it this way, the axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruits will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John's message called for real change. Rearrange your life if necessary. Stop. Listen to some positive music. Listen to something that encourages your soul. Listen to something that will encourage you and uplift you. 24 hours of CNN and the Fox News Channel will not make you a better Christian. What will it take for you to stop right now and to get right with God? I'm going to ask you another question. This is a challenging question, I guess. It's your next slide actually asks the question. Who 
could speak into your life? How much can I speak into your life? I'm trying desperately right now with a whole group of you. Really, how much can I say to you that you would receive it and actually begin a transformation? Why do you say those things that you say about yourself? Why do you do that? Stop! Can you receive that from me? That you look in the mirror and you don't see what God sees? You see what your flesh sees? And you don't like it? It's ugly, it's fat, it's droopy, it's aging, it's gray-haired, it's whatever it is. And you feed yourself all this negativity all day, every day. And God's just trying to whisper in your ear, I love you just the way you are. I created you just the way you are. How much can I say to you that you really would grab hold of it? And can I? Am I even somebody that you would consider that could speak into their lives that you would take hold of it? Because many people, oh, you're a minister? Walls up. There are nothing I'm going to say to that person at all that's going to penetrate their ears that they're going to hear for whatever their reason is. You know, that looks like pride. You know, that looks like selfishness to me. Sounds like you're letting the devil steal your joy. Sounds like you think too much of you and not enough of God. You might want to get right with your kids. You might want to get right with your parents. So in that, who can speak into your life? I mean, does the church, this church, does this pastor... have a responsibility to speak into your life? To hold you accountable to your conversion? To hold you accountable to your baptism? To hold you accountable to your confession of faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Who can do that? And do you think the pastor can, the church should, and you receive it? Mm hmm. And then which part? Just spiritual stability? Financial stability? Physical stability? Or get prayers all the time for people's physical well-being all the time. And then I might want to challenge somebody and go, you know, you might want to lay off three Sundays a day. The French fries at McDonald's three times a week might be too much. And you know what I get? Get away from me. Who are you to speak into my life? You know what? I won't speak into your life. But I get I have a feeling God might slap you upside the head. See, it's difficult to see. It's difficult for me to see people hurt themselves by their own actions and the own things that they do. Financially, spiritually, emotionally, physically, all the things that they do hurt themselves. And then what's even worse is that you watch them intentionally hurt others. Intentionally hurt others. Just to be spiteful. Just to be, right, contemptuous and hurtful. Well, I know. I just, I'm not going to talk to you all day. You know, it's like, okay. And I have to tell my wife, you know, the silent treatment is not punishment in our house, honey. Think of something else. <laughs> 
But to intentionally hurt it, it crushes the heart. When God's saying, love each other, and you're in, you, you go out of your way to be spiteful. And, oh, stop! Please stop! Truthfully, secretly, people don't want the church to know what the evil that they do. That's why they don't invite me into their homes. They'll dust off the Bible and throw it on the coffee table. You know, oh, they're the presence of the Lord. It's a, the presence of the Lord's long. It's not me. Long before I ever got here. God's in your house, I promise you. But listen, they'll avoid the church. They'll avoid the minister. They'll avoid God. Right? Because what happens? You can feel it in the room. Just the intensity of shame. The heavy weight of guilt is overwhelming. Because we're all in the same boat. We're all people that think these same things over and over and over again and do these things over and over and over again. And we just keep perpetuating sin. Stop. Is sin heavy? Of course it's heavy. Just ask Jesus who bore it for you. There was no sin in the life of Jesus. He became sin. Whose? I put him on the cross. I don't want to put him on the cross anymore. I want to live the joy, hope-filled life that he's talking about. Why he went to the cross? To eliminate it. To take it out of my life that I might walk a different walk. That I might live a different way. That I might be transformed in my mind. That I might live more peaceful, more hopeful, more joyful, more love-filled. To live differently than the world and to see things. From a spiritual nature as God sees them. The things that harm you and destroy you and crush your relationships and twist your heart. Things of this world, it's not God. Transformation can be difficult. Admitting you need change is tough. And it takes time. It takes effort. It takes soul searching. And no one here is exempt and when they asked this great man, John the Baptist, hey, they began to wonder, are you the Messiah? He told them he wasn't even worthy to untie the Messiah's sandals. None of us are. Jesus, for the elimination of our sin bore our sin. Please stop putting him on the cross. He came off the cross. He came off the cross and rose again to show there's a way for you. There's a way for you. Don't let this world, don't let sin influence you anymore. I've taken it from you. Stop. Please stop. Intentionally. Maybe that's where you started. Please stop intentionally sinning. You with me? The communion table is a great reminder of what Christ has done for us. If I could have my elders come forward I invite each and every one of you to participate in the taking of the body and the blood of Christ. For he did this for our redemption, for our, watch, remission and elimination of our sin. sir. Come on. I'm not coming to you. <laughs> Here we go, brother. Thank you. Got it? All right. 
Look at these soldiers, so well trained. Goodness great. All right. Jess Lewis, my friend, would you say a prayer over the body of Christ for us? Thank you. These moments are intentionally left quiet that you might examine your own heart and your own relationship before the Lord. took bread, he broke it, gave thanks, giving it to them, saying, take this and eat this, for this is my body, which is given up for you. Let us partake together.
given thanks. He gave it to them saying, take this and drink this. You know, for this is a cup of my blood spilled out, shed for the forgiveness, the elimination of your sins. Let us partake together. Hallelujah, my Father, for giving us your Son, sending him into the world to be given up for men. Knowing he'd be wounded and crucified on earth, Hallelujah, my Father, in his death is my birth. Father, may all those that partook, may they have the elimination of the sin in their life and a restored relationship with you. May we walk victorious and free indeed in the name of your son, amen. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. If you would stand with me, we'll just do a benediction. And there is, um, we're gonna decorate the tree and uh, whatever else we wanna do. I asked Glenn to kind of put a wreath together for us so we can put a wreath up there. Would a wreath look nice up there? Put a wreath up there, a wreath up there, yes. Yeah, so. We have, a, we have a couple of wreaths. We're going to put a wreath up there. Thank you, Glenn, for that. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know what we got for decorations and stuff, but uh, feel free. Make yourself at home. It's your church, too. A benediction for you. The first psalm, right out of the gate. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the ways that the sinners take or sit in the company of mockers Blessed is the one who sits and delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. May God go with you and be with you. Go serve your God. God bless you.